have a very interesting video about the notable, very famous limit, the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x. And this is a pretty famous limit, and most people know that it equates to one. And first of all, why is that even interesting? You know, most people just say, oh, well, limit as x goes to zero, well, we can just plug in zero into, we can plug in zero into both of these areas over here. Well, then we get sine of um, zero over zero, and we know that sine of zero equals zero, so this is just zero over zero. So, oh my goodness, this is, what is this? It's an indeterminate form. This is why, you know, the fact that this equals one is kind of crazy, it's kind of interesting. But, you know, most calculus students, you know, that at least, you know, are in second or third year of high school are going to say, well, you can e easily show this using Le Hopital's, or Le, I'm just going to call it Le Hopital's rule. Uh, my pronunciation is interesting. But, you know, you can easily show this using this rule. And if, if anyone doesn't know this rule, it's a very powerful rule. It's basically saying that the limit of two functions, f of x over g of x, is the same thing as the limit of the derivative of these two functions if these two functions give you an indeterminate form. So if, if f of x equals the limit of g of x equals either zero or plus minus infinity. So you know, there's so many examples. This is so powerful. Let's say the limit as x goes to zero, I mean, the limit as x goes to infinity actually of ln x over x. Well, we know this as x goes to infinity, ln x goes to infinity and x also goes to infinity. So we get an indeterminate form infinity over infinity. What's happening? Well, now using the Hopta's rule, um, we can say that this is the same thing as the limit as x goes to infinity of the derivative of ln x. Well, that's just one over x over the derivative of x. Well, that's just one. And we know as x goes to infinity, well, one over x goes to zero, one just stays as one. So this is zero over one, this equals zero. So this limit equals zero. And this is true because ln x grows way slower than x. Um, so, you know, this is just one classic example of the Hopta's rule. Um, and now, you know, why can't we use the same thing here? Let's try to use it here. Well, we're going to see that we're actually not allowed to because um, of a cyclical definition of the derivative of sine of x. First of all, let's just try to use the Hopta's rule. Well, we can say that this is the same thing as the limit as x goes to zero of, well, what's the derivative of sine x? It's just cosine x. What's the derivative of x? It's just one cosine as x goes to zero, well that's just one, so this is one over one equals one, let's go. The rules, the Lahata's rules never, never, like they allow us to use this. We get an indeterminate form of zero over zero, so we can look at the derivative. We know that the limit of g of x, so you know, does not equal zero, so the, the, the denominator is also okay. So the Hoffa's rules, they don't, they don't stop us from, from using this. We, we, we are very much allowed to use this, so why are we actually not allowed to? Well, it actually comes down to the derivative of sine of x. We all know that the derivative of sine of x equals cosine x, but how do we actually know this? We, we've been told this, there's ways to show it, but actually, to know this, we need to know that the limit as x goes to zero of sine of x over x equals one. Without, without knowing this, we cannot show that the derivative of sine of x equals cosine x. Or if I word it a bit differently, if we don't know what this limit is, if this limit is something else, then we actually don't know what the derivative of sine x of sine x is because this is one the derivative of sine x equals e, the derivative of sine x equals cosine x. If this equal to something else, the derivative of sine x could have been something completely different, which sounds crazy. How do we actually show this? Well, first of all, now how do we how do, how do we show the derivative of any function? The derivative of any function f of x. Well, it's defined. You know, the the definition of the derivative is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This is the this is the der the definition of the derivative of any function and you know it's just classic you know slope. We know that slope because you know the derivative is the the slope function basically and the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So you know if you have any function you know I mean I think most people know this but you know let's say here we have x plus h here we have x you know so th th this is our h um, x2 minus x1 just equals h and you know here we have our f of x plus h. Here we have our f of x. As this gets infinitely close to each other, as h gets to zero, we get the slope at one particular point x. Um, and you know th th this is why this is the famous slope definition. This is the definition of the derivative. Uh, and now, if we you know expand it for sine of x, how do we know? How do we know what the derivative of sine of x is? Well, that's just going to be the limit as h goes to zero of sine of x plus h minus sine of x over h. Um, and now, you know, it, it's not really obvious why we need this at all for the derivative of sine of x, but now let's use some double angle formulae. We all know, I mean, we all know, it's, um, it's a classic double angle formula. 
I mean, it's a classic trig identity, actually, that sine x plus h, or, you know, sine a plus b equals sine of x times cosine of h plus cosine of x times sine of h. This is, you know, you can also prove this, you can show this, it's a classic trig identity. We're not going to be showing it, but basically, you know, putting this back into here, we now get the we now get that the derivative of sine of x equals the limit as h goes to zero of sine of x, you know, you can make, make the video go a bit faster here, cosine x, uh, cosine h plus cosine x times sine of h. So I just, you know, I just copied this over instead of this, and then I put in the rest minus sine of x over h. This is the derivative of sine of x. And now we can group, uh, we, we can kind of group like terms and split the, the limit. So we basically get the limit as h goes to zero. What we're gonna do now is take sine of x outside of the expression, and what we're gonna be left with is cosine h minus one. So we just you know grouped these terms together, and now we'll divide it by h, and now what remains is plus the limit as h goes to zero. So we just split the limits of this. This is what remains, which is cosine x times sine of h over h. So, you know, this, this expression is the same as, as this expression. We just, you know, split the two terms and split the limits. You can do this. This is very much allowed. Uh, I'm missing a, oh, no, I'm not missing a bracket here. Well, now um, we can split this even further because, you know, the sine, sine of x, this is not in the limit of all. There's no h here. So we can take it out of the limit. Same for cosine x. We can take it out of the limit. So we see that the derivative of sine of x equals sine of x times this limit, limit as h goes to zero of cosine h minus one over h plus cosine x times another limit, which is gonna be the limit as h goes to zero of sine of h over h. And I think here people are already seeing what the problem is. Basically the derivative of sine x equals, this is gonna be some limit L1 and this is gonna you know approach to some limit L2. The derivative of sine of x, I'm just going to write it a bit more down here, the derivative of sine of x equals sine of x times this limit L1 plus cosine of x times this limit L2. Well, what is this over here? If we replace h with x, this is exactly the same thing we're trying to prove. This is the limit as h goes to zero of sine of h over h. This is the notable limit that we were talking about. We all know that the derivative of sine of x equals cosine of x, which means that you know, if we want this to hold, we need L1 to be equal to zero so that this term disappears, and we need L2 to be equal to one because if L1 is zero and L2 is one, then the derivative of sine of x is just cosine of x. Well, <laughs> just by saying that we know that the derivative of sine x equals is, just by saying that we know that what the derivative of sine x is, we just we just basically said that the limit as h goes to zero of sine of h over h has to equal to one. If we know what the derivative of sine x is, then you know, just with this expression right here, saying that L2 has to equal one, we just said that this has to be true. We, we're not proving anything. <laughs> we, we wanted to prove the statement at the top using the Hopton's rule, and we can, but by saying that the derivative of sine x equals cosine x, we just implied that, well, this has to be true already. So we can't prove it at all. Let's say this limit L2 equals something else. What if this limit, you know, L2 equals five? Well, then the derivative of sine x would be five times cosine x, which is, you know, not cosine x at all. <laughs> this has to be equal to one. We, there's no proving, there's no proving um, anything. It's a cyclical definition. By knowing, by saying that we want the derivative, you know, but by, by, by saying that we want to prove this, we already need to know that this is true. So it's a cyclic definition, and you know this is why you can't use the Hopton's rule to to show that the limit as h goes to zero, of, you know, or the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x equals one. And if some people are curious, you know, what what about this limit over here? You know, what about L one? Maybe this changes some things, and you can group them, and you can actually get rid of L two. You know, can, can L one save us? Well, actually, the limit as h goes to zero of cosine h minus one over h. Um, this is not a, a hyperbolic function, it's just cosine of h. We can also do x. Well, using another trig identity, we can be, you know, using some more trig identities, we can basically simplify this down to saying that this is the same as the limit as h goes to zero of negative um, sine h over two times sine h over two. Um, I, don't, I don't know why I'm writing this like this, sine h over 2 over h over 2. And again, we, we can split the limits. We can apply the limit here. 
and we can apply the limit here. Basically, you know, the limit as edge goes to zero of sine of h would that just equal zero? And the limit of edge goes to zero of sine of h over two over h over two, that's just the same thing as the limit of edge goes to zero of sine of h over h. It's it's the same thing because you know as edge goes to zero, if we divide it by two, it just goes to zero faster. So basically this limit over here equals to zero times our limit L2. So L1 equals zero times L2. The only thing we need to know is what L2 is. L1 basically equals zero, zero, zero already. Um, so this is why we're not allowed to use the Hoffman's rule to show this notable limit, the limit of sine of x over x, that that equals one. It's a cyclic definition. You know, most people are gonna say that you can use it, but now you can show them that actually, if you really look at what's happening, the derivative of sine x is defined using this limit over here. So you can't prove this limit by already knowing what it is. This is why you can't use it. I, I think it's a pretty cool fact and it kind of, you know, teaches you a lesson that a lot of times in math, you know, you really gotta, you, you can't just say that you know something, you really gotta show, well, how, how do we know something? And just by looking at the simple definition of a derivative that, you know, everyone learns in high school, we can actually see what's happening under the hood and why this does not actually work for this. Thank you for watching.